Welcome to Coming from Left Field, where we have conversations about politics, books, and current events with your host, Greg Gottles and Pat Cummings. Is the system for delivering our news in the country fundamentally broken? We know that media bashing is as old as the nation itself. George Washington once referred to reporters covering his administration as infamous scribblers. Is the mainstream media Natalie Nabobs of negativism or the red beating heart of freedom and democracy? What exactly is the media? Let's discuss. Well, hello, welcome, welcome back, Greg, and my good friend uh, Jim Painter, and uh, let's uh, let's talk about the media. So let me let me provide a little bit of background about this this topic. We did a podcast, and my friend Jim, who went to high school with me, and then through the blessings of COVID, we reconnected uh, just a, a year or so ago after. This, uh, being separated for 50 some years. And in one of the responses to my podcast, I think it was the cancel culture podcast that we did, Greg, uh, uh, you wrote on one of your comments, uh, one thing we often often makes me cringe is people start talking about the media without providing a specific definition of the media. You, you said the media includes a wide range of mass communication platforms, such as a matchbox books, covers, newspaper, magazines, cable network. They're all different. And the media is not just one hom homogenous group. And I thought about that and I thought you are absolutely right. You know, we have all kinds of media. Jim, you are our local expert in the media because you have been a, a photographer, a reporter, an editor, and you spent your career in the media. Tell, tell us a little bit about your background. Well, uh, like you said, I, <laughs> I'm a newspaper man, and uh, I worked all of my adult life, uh, 40 years almost, in, uh, for community newspapers. Uh, so that's my field of expertise. Uh, you know, I, I didn't work for a major metropolitan daily or uh, the New York Times or anything like that. I worked for uh, my first job out of college and uh, Pat didn't mention that we also went to the same university <laughs> so, at the same time, of course. And uh, uh, I got my journalism degree and moved to Arizona and my first job was with a newspaper called The News Sun. And uh, I was hired as a chief photographer Eventually, that, that was a family-owned operation uh, up until 1984, and then uh, the, the publishers uh, sold it to the Ottawa newspaper chain, which is a subsidiary of Dow Jones, which also owns the Wall Street Journal. Uh, so we were in the Wall Street Journal family at that point. And uh, eventually, Ottawa sold it to Thompson, Thompson decided to get out of the newspaper business and sold it to an outfit called Freedom, uh, which uh, was run another family operation. Uh, and they stressed, uh, you know, a libertarian point of view. Uh, their, their flagship newspaper was the Orange County Register. And from the new son, uh, the original publishers, their son, who is my age, our age, Pat, decided to take his profits and start a newspaper of his own called the West Valley View. Uh, he hired me on a part-time basis when he started in 1986. And uh, eventually that newspaper grew with the area. Of course, Phoenix, the Phoenix area was uh, growing by leaps and bounds. Eventually we uh, became a twice weekly publication with a circulation of 80,000 and I was the managing editor. And, uh, and is that the paper where you went after Sheriff Joe Arpaio? Arpaio? Yes. So uh, we took we took Arpaio to court and we beat him uh, in Superior Court. He appealed. We beat him in the Court of Appeals and he appealed again. But the Arizona Supreme Court said, nobody, you lost. Give it up. <laughs> <laughs> and what was that? Was he just you were asking for information for your. Right, right. He, he, just says, he was shutting. Right. 
uh, he wouldn't let his uh, public information officers talk to our reporters. They quit sending us press releases. And all of this was because he didn't like the coverage he was getting in our newspaper. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so he cut us off, mm -hmm. which was a clear violation you know, from, from press releases, as well as not allowing our reporters into their uh, offices or substations to get police reports, which are public records. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, they, they were a clear violation of the Arizona public records law. So we took them to court and we won. So you've been in media at the when it was the height in a way uh, with uh, you know local reporters uh, sending people out on stories, uh, editors supervising and honing that, and then it started to I guess fall off with what advertising with Google and with the loss of the revenue model. Well, I, I could. Uh, what happened to us was. Uh, uh, the West Valley View was, I mean, it was just growing by leaps and bounds. I mean, we just, uh, the publisher, uh, we moved into a brand new building that he had uh, hired the premier architectural firm in Arizona to, to design. And they broke ground on that building in January of uh, 2008. <laughs> which I believe is when they say the Great Recession started. Oh, goodness, yeah. With the recession, a lot of the traditional advertisers like uh, car dealerships, uh, real estate agencies, uh, just about everybody. I mean, the first thing they cut back was their advertising budget. And so we dropped from doing publishing 136 to 144 pages per week at 65% advertising down to 48 pages per oh week gosh. at 50% advertising in the matter of six months. That's a third. Over the course of six months. Third of the paper, yeah. Right. So, so were you influenced at all by all the president's men and how that kind of elevated right. journalism? I mean, prior to that, journalists yes. were just like regular, you know, they're like carpenters or plumbers. Or, I mean, they were regular people. They, were, they weren't necessarily right. highly trained academians. Of course, I was, I was in college getting my journalism degree when that movie came, came out. Mm -hmm. So I was, already, I was already a journalism major when when all the president's men came out but it, i did find it inspirational yeah uh, uh, so yeah before that i remember the, the the story says uh before that movie came out they would say uh you know jim are you still a journalist and and you would say yes i am but don't tell my mother she still thinks i'm playing piano in a whorehouse so <laughs> it doesn't but you didn't have the greatest standing so so yeah. so one of the things that one of the articles you sent me, uh, Greg, that I thought was interesting was this article about, um, you know, it's a bias in media article. And, and Jim, when, I, when you, you listen to this, think of being an editor. Uh, they're talking about two articles about the, the Crown Prince Saudi. Uh, and once the article was when Biden was president and when Trump was president. And when Biden's president, the article says, Biden won't penalize Saudi crown over Jahoski's killing, fearing relationship breach, New York Times. This is the same newspaper when Trump was president. In extraordinary statement, Trump stands with Saudis despite Kosowski's killing. And then it gets worse when you read the article. How do you, as a newspaper reporter or newspaper editor, deal with what appears to be kind of obvious slants and, and bias in how you present the information to the readers. How, how, do you, how do you correct for that? First of all, I don't believe there's anything uh, such as an unbiased newspaper or TV or, or any kind of news report. I mean, uh, the media is made up of human beings and human beings are biased, right down to you know the the very words you choose to write a story are 
dependent on your personal bias. So, and I don't think it's any secret that the New York Times is a liberal newspaper. It always has been. So why are we surprised that they're biased? Yeah. I mean, you know, newspapers in this country have always been biased. As a matter of fact, there was a time when they proudly proclaimed their bias in their name like the Globe Democrat or the Arizona Republican, which is now the Arizona Republic. They dropped the and, you know, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and uh, to try to, I guess, hide the bias. I don't know. There was a time, like I said, when they proudly proclaimed their bias. But then we went through a period where, oh, no, we have to tell people that we're not biased and we're impartial. So they tried to so where did this idea about an unbiased media come from? From the media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, so, don't know if, I, I don't know if I 100% agree that New York Times is liberal. I think they certainly represent the interest of the powerful. Um, and, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not seeing... Well, again, Greg, this is this article you sent me from the New York Times. Uh, it wasn't from the New York Times. It was Fairness and Accuracy in the Media. It's a two thousand. It's an it's a March eighth, so it's a week old, and it talks about how the in Brazil, Brazil's run by kind of a very conservative Trump, and the person that he took over with, uh, Lula da Silva, uh, he accused of corruption and they had him arrested and there was all sorts of this conflict. Well, there was just this six terabyte dump of information on that and found out that he was completely set up, that it, there was no, nothing to the trial, that he was inappropriately removed from office and, you know, and, and set up, if you will. Chirp, not one New York Times article covering that. And th that's a pretty big deal. So sometimes what they choose to cover and don't cover, you know, is I, I, certainly the New York Times is one of the only papers making money, right? Am I right? It, uh, I assume uh, most of them are not making money. You're correct. They just, they just don't make money, yeah. It's, it's a frustrating... There are, there are a lot of issues folded in here. What do you mean, Greg? There's a lot of well, issues I mean, folded in. Uh, I agree with Jim. Uh, well, I agree with Jim. There's a lot of... Uh, uh, a long history of newspapers being biased policies and news coverage. And that's been more and more abused in the last period. Um, and there were more and more newspapers, so the newspapers reflected more and more points of views. Today, with concentration consolidation, that's not true. So I think that's the trend that's disturbing, is that there are fewer opinions. Most of the opinions today are binary, simply binary. So you have the Fox News versus everybody else. And uh, the third thing that enters in the picture is entertainment. I think with the advent of television, the news medium, all the different media, different mediums uh, have become more and more affected with entertainment. They become more entertainment driven. And that's been a negative uh, uh, influence on, on, on the news. The separation between the news, entertainment and advertising has been blurred. Uh, uh, if you look at MSNBC, they've taken on a Fox model, haven't they? I mean, you know, Fox was they have. a pretty clear model and you look at MSNBC basically just talks about how how silly all the QAnon people are and how we are more on top of things and the opposition is <laughs> deplorables or whatever in some fashion. And you know, and Fox News talks about how they're making fun of us and they don't respect the fact that we have traditional values that are important to us and they're East Coast elites. And so it's just this kind of back and forth, but I think you had mentioned this, Jim, when I was talking to you in preparation for this, that if you look at these cable news reporters, the reports, they, they, they just don't essentially have any news. It's a mostly right. commentary. I, I mean, you know, how often do they cut to their own reporters reporting? They don't. Right. They get on there and they say, 
they'll start a conversation with saying, well, according to a story in today's New York Times, or according to a story in today's Washington Post, and then they'll have a bunch of talking heads come in and discuss that story. That's not reporting. Right. Yeah, yeah that's another, just people pontificating. Another, another right. disturbing right. trend is the uh, uh, lack of uh, bureaus. And this is longstanding, but in the old days, in the 40s and into the 50s, every network, every media group had its bureaus scattered around the world, not just in the United States, but all around the world. So they had their slant based on those bureaus. Those bureaus have all dried up. Essentially, only a couple of uh, newspapers still maintain anything like a bureau in various European capitals, in uh, African capitals, Asian capitals. So what you're getting is a redigestion of news. And more and more, they're just simply press releases too often from the US embassies that are in those areas. Right. Uh, they, they release a press in, uh, release that describes what's going on and what our role is. And the, the various uh, newspapers and television stage, uh, uh, channels pick those up and regurgitate them. Right. Right. And I think what we're talking about is the major problem uh, facing the news media today is the lack of monetization. I mean, uh, when, when the advertising dried up and, and why, you know, like if you're an advertiser, uh, you have something to sell. Why buy an ad in a newspaper or on TV when you could create your own website uh, you got houses to sell. Now you can show 360 degree views of every house you have on the market. You have a car to sell. You can show as many pictures uh, of that car from as many different angles as you want. You can't do that in TV, on TV or in a newspaper. So they really, you know, the traditional advertisers have no reason to buy ads. Right on the uh, in the traditional news media so they run out they their their funding is much smaller smaller than it used to be something's got to go usually the first thing to go are the reporters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you don't have anybody actually gathering information you only have people writing opinions about the information that they do have so Here's another another angle on this. Greg, in our last podcast, we were chatting and I made some um, uh, reference about how you didn't know what you were talking about with China and that the, uh, you know, the minorities there are being oppressed and, you know, and this is, uh, you know, this is quite obvious and everyone seems to know this and, you know, how can you defend China? So in your very subtle and very nice way, you started to dribble me articles and you sent me five articles and they came from, uh, Jim, I don't know if you know of these sources, the Mint Press News, Progressive.org, Orion something Tribune, Newsbreed and the Gray Zone. And all of these were very good articles that we're talking about how much of the reporting sent to the New York Times is coming from one kind of conservative source that isn't very credible, that the with some of these minorities, they, the China has come in and increased the lifespan and all of these stories of mass sterilization were actually not that at all. It was just healthcare where they provided people with birth control, birth, birth control. you know. And I read these articles and I go, Jesus, you know, I, I, okay, I'm sure there are some bad things going on there. I, I'm, I'm sure there are, but it was quite obvious after you pushed these articles to me that we're not really getting good information, especially if you're thinking of the new, the record, the, the, the newspaper of record, which was the New York Times, you know, if they're not providing this to us, you're not going to get this on. How are you going to get this information? How how do you how do you determine what's right? And and maybe you know. Well, I I, I, I have a question. I have a question. How yeah. did you find out the information is wrong? 
I don't know if it's wrong, but I, I certainly got a lot of information that my biases well, were coming from a small group I, I, of, I, I don't know, what do you think, Greg? Well, I, I, th I, th I think the, uh, the point is that these counter arguments are never addressed by the mainstream media. It's not that they're right. I mean, I don't know if they're right. How would I know if they're right? How would I know which one is right? But they remind us that there are more than one point of view. When the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, the Los Angeles Times, when all these papers have the same story and there's no discussion, there's no disputing, and then you run across, I mean, we're not talking about aliens, you know, coming on spaceships. We're talking about credible stories. You just mentioned some of the facts. Why aren't those facts brought to the fore and disputed? Why, why, aren't the, why aren't the writers from the mainstream media saying, yeah, we're aware that people are saying these things, but they're wrong because we went and investigated, or we're going to investigate, or we're going to send somebody there, or we're going to talk to people and ask them about that. But instead, it's just ignored. And I think that's the issue. It's not who's right and who's wrong. It's just that there may well be some truth out there it's getting overlooked. I'll give you an example. Probably the most venerated investigative uh, uh, investigative reporter in America is uh, Cy Hirsch, Seymour Hirsch, right? Who did uh, My Lie and uh, the host of things, and uh, I don't know how many Pulitzer prizes he's gotten. But as time marched on and the media changed, for example, around Iraq and the uh, weapons of mass destruction as the media swung into this binary situation of Fox News versus everybody else, here's the only way you could read Cy Seymour Hirsch in America was by subscribing to the London Review of Books. The New York Review of Books, Review of Books dropped him. The Times, the Washington Post, we used to write for. And the New York Times, he used to write for. And none of them would publish his work. And I ask, why is that? Did he, did, he, did he break some rule? Did he commit some faux pas? I mean, why can he just be banished? Uh, to me, that's a telling uh, a comment on where the media is today, where the mass media, the mainstream media is today, that Seymour Hirsch can't get published. Yeah. Well, let me follow that up with something more contemporary. Uh, Matt Taibbi, who I subscribe to his Substack. Um, was I was listening to a podcast with him today, and he was saying that back in in December of 2016, he went on Chris Hayes, MSNBC, and this is before the Mueller report and everything had come out, and he made this kind of benign comment about, I don't know for sure if Russia is in fact truly, you know, actively interfering in all of these elections. Certainly they have influences and they do certain things that kind of try to push the, but we don't really know whether or not Trump is picking up the phone and working in collusion, in collusion with the Russians. And he subsequently has gone on to bring that point to bear. And, and if you look at him right now, he's correct. His observations were correct at that time has never been asked back on MSNBC since. You know, he's just off. And he was, you know, on a lot. So, so it's, it's it, when you present information that goes against these, you know, the, the um, I guess it's kind of the theme of how that cable news op is operating, you, you, know, you don't get back on. How, how many times has Glenn Greenwald been on cable news? Thomas Franks. Thomas Franks went after the Clinton administration and went after Hillary and went after the Democrats. He's, he, he admits that he's just not been brought back on cable news since. So you yeah. get, you know, I don't know. How do you find it? How do you well, find I mean, you know, that's, that's a problem for people who only, who only have one source of information whether it's MSNBC or Fox News or the New York Times, if you only have one source of information, then yeah, you're probably not getting the full picture, no matter what the story is. So, I mean, I think we've already established that the media are biased. Right. I mean, 
Has anybody, is anybody disagreeing? So once you recognize that they're biased and you recognize which way they're biased, then you can make intelligent, informed decisions about who you're going to believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think in a democracy, a, a press is essential. I mean, it, it doesn't make sense to call any system a democracy if there's not a source of information for people, a reliable source of information or better yet, sources of information. And that's where it gets sticky because Jim's right. People just rely on what they want to believe, the source they picked, and that's who they want to believe, and that's who they're going to listen to. And so it makes for uh, ill-informed decisions when it comes to voting, discussions with your friends, uh, all the political aspects of a person's lives are polluted if they don't have good source of information to make decisions. And I think uh, it's the trend that's disturbing, the trend away from that. A lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, the internet is just destroying a lot of traditional media. I mean, it just uh, is not viable anymore. Okay, that, that's true. That, that is 100% true. It's the, the internet uh, is, the traditional media are struggling with the internet. Uh, and I'm not so sure that's a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, the way I see it, it's sort of like when the, the asteroid hit the earth and wiped out the dinosaurs. Well, it wiped out the dinosaurs, but all these tiny little mammals survived. And eventually they became big mammals. And I think that's what's happening right now. We're seeing an evolution in the way news is gathered and delivered. It's going away from the traditional news media, newspapers, magazines, TV, radio, and it's going to the web. And so you have a lot of uh, other sources on the web like Politico, Huffington Post, or whatever. There's myriad news sources on the web that are gathering their own news and presenting it, presenting it on the web. So, you know, it's not like the news media is dying it's evolving, it's changing. And old guys like us, we're used to the traditional media and we see it disappearing and we're alarmed. Yeah, yeah. But there's no real reason to be alarmed because you guys are talking about stories, not just you guys, but it was like, okay, a, a, a former editor, or not a former editor, he's still an editor, but a, a, a guy that I used to work with, very conservative, and he kept posting these memes on his Facebook page about, well, here's another story you won't read in the media. And so finally, one day I responded, I said, well, if you're not seeing it in the media, how do you know about it? And he said, well, I got it on the internet or whatever. I said, isn't that a form of media? Isn't that one of the mediums? Right. So you are getting the information from the media. It's just not the media that you grew up with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But how do you, how do you, when you have these, what do they call them? News deserts that, that maybe that they just don't have, they don't have, you know, local That's coverage a of governor. That's a problem. How do you, how does a school district operate where you're not getting information. Seattle Times has had a lot of contention with the COVID and the kids staying home and, and the teachers and who gets vaccinations and, and what. The, the coverage of education by Seattle Times is a grant from Bill Gates. It's the, called the, the, the Education Lab, which he buys reporters. <laughs> he, he bought educational coverage. And, you know, and sometimes it's fine, but, you know, it's also pro-charter schools. It's also pro-testing. It's also pro-teachers need to be, you know, evaluated and put in a tier system of uh, salaries. I mean, you know, it has, it has all of the, the biases that Bill Gates does with waiting for Superman kind of thing. And, I, and at least that's some coverage. That's some right. coverage. Most places I have, they don't have any coverage. I, I right, don't know. Right. That, that. As, as a community you know, newspaper guy, that is a major concern of mine, is that, you know, what, who was it who said all politics is local? Anyway, uh, and it's true. I mean, the decisions made at the local level probably have more of an impact 
on our lives than the decisions being made in Washington, D.C. You know, how much of your property tax is going up because of the school district or whatever. Uh, uh, you know, how, how, how much are your city taxes going up because they have to repave all your streets, that sort of thing. And, you know, we, when you don't have local newspapers to cover those things or to hold public officials' feet to the fire, like we did with Arpaio, then, you know, the public is really the ones who are suffering because they don't, not only do they not know what their local governments are doing, they don't even know if whatever they're doing is being done legally. Right, right. Yeah. Let, let, can, let me ask, a, can I ask a question of both of you? If, if we envision the media as megaphones, obviously there are some people like uh, Jeff Bezos that can buy a big megaphone, the Washington Post or whatever. Uh, a major network today is a multi, multi, multi billion dollar operation. And uh, these, these sub stacks or whatever that you, you're fond of are small. They're very tiny, though they're generating some income for people. So you have different differential megaphones. And the point of view of those people that can afford the biggest megaphone probably is different than the point of view of a person, let's say in Bessemer, Alabama, that's trying to get the message about organizing Amazon workers out. Those are entirely different megaphones. Bezos has a big one and those people have a little one. Does this create a problem I mean, is this a problem for, uh, for, 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 for spreading information to the masses of people? It's a problem, I think, if you don't have enough guys, different people, rich enough to buy <clears throat> multiple megaphones. Because not even rich people agree with each other. They're all going to have different points of view. So if you've only got like one Bezos, uh, then you've got a problem. But if you've got multiple, and that, that's the way it's always been. I mean, it's the people who had the money to, to buy a press are the ones who had the voice. That's always the way it's been. Yeah, what's, what's the saying? Don't get in a fight with someone that buys uh, uh, ink by, in by the barrel. Right. Well, you look at Bezos, why did he buy the Washington Post? Because he cares about news? No, he bought it because he wanted to influence opinions for his, well, you know, his company. I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure that's entirely true. Uh, uh, I, I was privileged enough to get, uh, 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 I visited the Washington Post two summers ago and was actually, actually sat in in one of their editorial um, meetings. And... Uh, they claimed, the people I talked to there, the employees claimed that Bezos kept a hands-off approach editorially. Mm. So, and these, so, I mean, I had, you know, I trust they seemed like honest people. I didn't get the impression that they were lying to me. Yeah. So. Well, that's good then. That's good. And they said that if it weren't for him, uh, they wouldn't, they probably only have about half as many reporters as they do now. And they do a lot of good reporting. They've had right. some good, good stories, yeah. But of course it could be the case that they were hired because they agreed with the position or line of Jeff Bezos. I mean, that was the litmus test for they're having those jobs. So of course, right. when they have the jobs, they're going to that that might be true at the you know we have a lot of pressure because we already agree with Jeff Bezos but I don't know if that's true or not but that that's yeah uh, I mean you know I mean Bezos might have a say in who the managing editor is but from that point on I doubt if he hasn't if he even cares who the managing editor hires under him so yeah it'd be interesting to look at the Washington Post how they're covering the Alabama Union thing you know <laughs> Well, the good news is his wife, Amazon, yeah. 
His wife landed on her feet and she married a high school science teacher from Lakeside. His, his wife, they got the largest uh, divorce settlement in history, $35 billion, which wow. Bezos wow. made in one month with the COVID thing. He, he made his divorce settlement back in one month. <laughs> oh, who knows? Who knows? So I, I hope they're all happy. So yeah, that's a, that's, that, that, that's, that's interesting. So I, I guess the other question I have is, is that, so we're trying to find information to run our democracy. And we realize that the newspapers are kind of no longer viable in providing us a lot of that information. And we're, and media is changing. You're getting media from different places, you know, podcasts, for example. But how do you how do you truly find out what you need to be effectively informed for making good decisions? I mean, I I read a lot. I spend a lot of time kind of looking at things from different angles. But I don't think I think I can I, I do that at a level that's different than most people. They don't have time. They're not retired with uh, plenty of time to do whatever the heck they want regarding regarding that. How, how, you well. Know, I you know if if when it comes down to uh, the the items on your ballot, there's things like Ballotpedia, uh, uh, the the League of Women Voters. They usually uh, post uh, pros and cons in any ba ballot issue, uh, and I think they try to be objective about it. Uh, so I mean, there there are lots of sources of information, right? I mean, where where do where do the media get their information? Yeah, well, you're right though. I, you're right, Jim. When I look at the ballot and I look at the judges, I go to the website, to the progressive site. I read their articles and I tend to vote what their recommendations are. So yeah. I kind of kind of trust them. They I've uh, I've watched uh, Pittsburgh uh, newspapers go from two uh, strong newspapers that had, were had political differences, strong political differences, the Tribune. Post-Gazette, the Tribune? Yeah, the Post-Gazette, uh, Craig uh, runs the Post-Gazette and, and uh, Scaife ran, you know, was a multi, multi, he's dead now, but a billionaire who uh, uh, was notorious for his right-wing politics and they went head to head and eventually the Tribune Review is gone. And now I understand, uh, I stopped my subscription about a year ago, but the Post-Gazette is just a Sunday hard copy and the rest is online. The Trib, Trib Live is online as well. But more and more, uh, you see more and more uh, uh, news service articles. So there's very little real original investigation and any real original reporting going on and much of what you see in the print media, what's left of it, we have some small weekly community papers and, and commercial papers, but they're picked up from um, the local TV channels, which give you, in my view, the worst possible news because everything is in a one minute or 30 second video and it's really entertainment. It's made, it's entertainized. Mm -hmm. And so the, the quality of what you're getting, it's not just a question of the quantity, or the source, it's the quality of it, how it comes to you is more and more trivialized. And how do you see that? How do you see that as a problem? And if you do, what's, what's the answer? Where do you get depth? <laughs> well, if you're asking me, I mean, yeah, you know, Jim, this we're is... asking you, you're the, pro, you're the, you're the <laughs> expert, Jesus. Well, I think you. we're, we're watching a, 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 a media, uh, the, the newspapers, are in their death throes. I mean, they're just dying. They're slow, it, they're, they're gas, they're hanging on for dear life, but it's inevitable. They're gonna pass away. <laughs> and so- <laughs> They're on, oh good, yeah. So, you know, they don't have the funding, they don't have the money anymore to hire as many reporters or editors. So you see a lot of really bad grammar and things like that in newspapers nowadays. Uh, so, I, 
you know, I don't know what to do about that. I mean, there is really nothing that, no, if, if they knew what to do about it, they would change and they would thrive, but nobody knows what to do about it. How about a BBC? They don't know. How about a BBC model, Jim? Everybody pays a certain amount or gets vouchers to consume news or something like that. Well, I mean, if you're getting your, 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 if the government is funding the newspapers, then you have a sort of a Soviet system of government or uh, press. Right. So. And then you've got NPR, which the biggest funder for that is Koch Brothers. So you're not going to get a lot of stories uh, <laughs> that are going to go against those interests. So. Well, yeah, the, the infection of money, it's the infection of the media of money, whether it's a uh, a Bezos owning a newspaper, whether it's a conglomerate like um, these big media companies like Les Mundis, who controls all these companies and corporations, entertainment, news, and so on, they blend them together. There's just a really kind of a toxic mix that's going on, that's out there now for, for information, for gathering information. And I'm old fashioned, I'm a Luddite. I'm convinced that ideas are conveyed best when they're chewed upon, like, uh, like words. And visuals, videos really are the enemy of that. I mean, you're seeing confrontation more and more of people video casting something and someone taking that and putting it in an entirely different context and totally disrupting the meaning that might be conveyed there because it's not propositional. It's not a statement that you can examine and look at. It's what you see and you see all kinds of things. So. I guess I'm really a Luddite. I, I, I wish there weren't even television because it really distorts uh, how we see things. Yeah. Hey, I'd like to change the subject. Um, Jim and I are both brats. And I don't know if you know what a brat is. It, it's a, it's a, term, a term of endearment for somebody who grew up whose father or mother was in the service and were children of the children of the service. So there's a there's a great uh, documentary that Chris Christopherson um, is the narrator for called Bratz. <laughs> That's uh, about that. And, and uh, grew up on military bases here and there. And both Jim and I uh, started to kind of become interested in our fathers and the Second World War and what they did. And Jim, you had an opportunity to interview your father and, um, and you wrote a book about your dad called the black march and it's on amazon it's only you know ten dollars or so on prime and it's both your dad and my dad were flew b-17s and tell me about your whole project of kind of uh, celebrating your father with your novel and your interest in b-17s and and tell us a little bit about the book the uh the black march well the way that came about was uh uh my father when he was in his 70s uh he uh became a member of uh the uh, pennsylvania xpow's organization and they encouraged their members to speak about their experiences because a lot of the when I when I was growing up I only heard my father talk about his war experiences twice uh, up and before I became an adult and so they encouraged these guys to talk about their experiences and they told them if you keep keep it bottled up inside you you're going to die younger than you have to and so they talked, they encouraged them to do things like write their memoirs and that sort of thing. So my dad wrote his war memoirs and I helped him edit those. And as I was reading his, about his experiences in the war, I, it just totally changed the way I looked at my father. It was like, wow, now I understand why you are like you are. Right. Because it turns out now uh, we, we didn't know it. Nobody knew about PTSD back in those days, but he suffered from PTSD for all of his life. And but when I was editing, helping ed edit his memoirs and going through all of this, I was amazed. I thought, wow, man, this is like you you could make a movie about this. And I think it's probably true about any of those guys who served in combat in the eighth air force or whatever 
any one of them, you can pick them at random and make a movie about their war experiences and it would be, you know, high drama. Right. I mean, these guys got on those planes knowing that they had, you know, like a one in three chance of not coming back right. every time they got on those planes. And yet they still got on those planes. And, uh, and then after he was shot down, he was captured by the Germans. He endured uh, all kinds of horrific things while he was a prisoner of war uh, that eventually culminated when what came to be known as the Black March. It, it's not nearly as well known as like the Bataan Death March, although about as many uh, allied POWs died on the Black March as in the Bataan Death March. And it lasted 86 days during the harshest winter in, er or in European history up until that time. It was the same winter as, you know, Bastogne and you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. So it, it was horrible. And these guys were forced to march 86 days outside with only what they had on their backs when they left the prison camps. Wow. And, you know, so I thought after I retired and I had time on my hands, I, I thought that more people would be inclined to read this if it was a fictionalized account. It was sort of like, you know, like the movie Dunkirk. Mm -hmm. That's a fictionalized account of an actual event. More people watched that movie than it would have watched a documentary about Dunkirk. Mm -hmm. So I decided maybe I could get, you know, this is, this is an event in World War II that very few people knew about. Maybe more people would know about it if they were to read about it in, in, uh, as, as like uh, an adventure drama, fictional, historical fiction book. And that's why I wrote the book. And I, and I, you posted something on Facebook. I think I got a hold of you after we, after I, you know, I said, well, I'll read your book. And I'm reading it and I'm going, I'm, as I'm reading, I'm thinking, you're a good writer, but then <laughs> you should be. You've spent your whole life in right. recording and editing and, you know, so, but, you know, the, it, 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 it tells the story with such authentic uh, dialogue and, banter and yet when you have finished the story you really do know what happened i had no idea i had no idea about that the, the that march and and you brought it to life for me and made it interesting to learn more about it and um so it's it's really a good book and it's it's well worth um i will link to it in our 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 notes below and yeah um the other thing, Jim, that is changing the subject is you are a remarkable photographer and you have a kind of a, you know, I, everybody's a photographer with the, with the iPhone now, but I, you're a real photographer and combine different mediums, fine art. Tell me a little bit about that. I'm sure came from your years of being a photographer in journalism, but you're still doing that. Oh yeah, it's still my my favorite pastime, my favorite hobby. Favorite hobby. Photography. Yeah. And and you're going through some old old. Uh, uh, you said. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. COVID, you know the the confinement that we've been forced <laughs> into because of COVID has uh, forced me to come up with different ways to entertain myself, and so one of those ways was to take like 50 years of negatives and start scanning them. You know, I, I process film, save the negatives and never print them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or just print one, one picture from an entire strip that they used in the newspaper. And uh, so I have all these pictures, all these negatives, I started scanning them and I suddenly realized I was sitting on a treasure trove of, uh, of a photo photographic history of this part of the Phoenix metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. I'm going to five post, cities post a link to that. Yeah. You, you know, you sitting in the car with a uh, gold water and hanging out with McCain and spring wow. train. Yeah, that sort of Raleigh dates me Springer. sitting in a car with gold water. <laughs> <laughs> it does. <laughs> but they're just going, Oh my God. You know, Diane Sawyer covering when she was, you know, this, this oh, 35 Leslie year old. Stahl. 
Or and Leslie, Leslie Stahl is still working. Yeah. <laughs> She's a beautiful 35 year old reporter. And you know, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's been fun to see that you need to post more of that, Jim. So, oh, I intend to. Yeah. Good. Good. All right. Well, listen, guys, this has been exactly what I wanted to uh, have it be, which is just an overview of, uh, you know, the media. And I think we did a, we did a fairly good job uh, uh, yeah. having different opinions regarding it all. So Jim, and thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. It's a big deal to say. Well, thank you for inviting me, Pat. Oh, come on. Thanks, it was Jim. nice meeting you, Craig. Appreciate it. Be all right. Nice meeting you. Appreciate your uh, comments. Good, good. Wish you the best. All right. Best All right. retirement. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, Thanks. we'll see you folks. Goodbye. Bye. See ya.